Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So why don't we just start? So we have, we're very happy here to have uh, Greg Lewis from Harvard, and uh, most of you probably, well, some of you have been here for longer probably know Greg because he has been a, a visitor before and you know has been a consulting researcher for a long time and uh, actually even though only told Irene yesterday that uh, we need an office for Greg, um, it still worked out because he's still on an NDA. <laughs> so that kind of saved me because Irene was about to be very upset with me but we shouldn't have to do that part. <laughs> it, actually, it actually worked out fine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure she will. Um, <laughs> and uh, Greg is going to tell us about procurement auctions. <laughs> OK, great. Uh, thanks very much for having me. Um, yeah, so I, I wasn't entirely sure what to present when I was invited. And uh, so in the end, I ended up picking something quite orthogonal to stuff I've done while I'm working at Microsoft, uh, just, just to, I don't know, so you can see something slightly different from me. So this is, uh, this is joint work with uh, Pat Byrie, uh, who's uh, now the chief economist at Amazon, but was my advisor. Um, and, uh, and we're going to tell you a little bit about um, public procurement, and particularly time incentives in public procurement. And this is based on a, a couple of papers we've worked on together, uh, one of which is published and one of which we're revising. Um, OK, so uh, basic motivation, uh, public procurement turns out to be economically important. Um, I, to be honest, I had no idea how important until I started looking into it. It turns out it's about 10 to 15 percent of GDP in most developed countries. It's a massive, massive amount of GDP is spent in procurement, and, it, and it's ubiquitous. Uh, various kinds of procurement, uh, federal procurement, the largest source of procurement in most cases is military procurement. Um, uh, but health care, through Medicare, there's a lot of procurement going on in the States as well. A large part of any state budget is highway procurement, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. And then even if you go down to sort of local levels, there are procurement contracts for, you know, contracts for trash removal, contracts for pothole repair, right? These things are getting, uh, are getting let all the time. And uh, economists are interested in uh, contract design and letting procedures. And there are two main designs that economists have sort of noticed are, are pretty common and have been sort of interested in. So one of that is the one of those is the cost plus design. So this is a contract in which uh, uh, the owner hires a contractor to do something and agrees to pay them uh, basically their cost of doing whatever this task is of the pothole repair or the highway construction plus a fixed fee. Okay, so cost plus. The other main kind of design is a fixed price contract where you uh, negotiate a fixed price up front, which is the amount of money that I'll pay you to do this job. And uh, if your costs happen to run over that amount, that's your problem. If your costs run under, then you make a profit. Okay, and so this is the, the second main kind of design. And uh, so uh, Lafon Tirol and others uh, have written a number of papers based on this, uh, thinking about this trade-off between cost plus versus fixed price designs. And the, the sort of the main takeaway from that, that literature is that um, the problem with cost plus contracts is a moral hazard problem. So if you uh, offer to pay people all their costs, then they have no incentives to take cost saving measures, right? They're not going to work very hard to reduce costs. And uh, as a result of that, you might end up paying a lot more in the long run than you should for this, this project. Fixed price contracts, by contrast, are sort of high-powered incentives. So you're basically saying you're the residual claimant on any amount of money you're able to save. If you go ahead and take a bunch of cost-saving measures, that adds to your profit. And so you should expect that, uh, that under this sort of system, um, the final cost might be lower. The trade-off here is, that, is an adverse selection problem. If there are many different kinds of contractors out there, under a cost-plus regime, uh, basically, the, the contractors don't get any benefit from any asymmetric information. If they happen to be very cheap, since you're only paying them their costs, you get that cheapness, right? You, you, you get it up front. On the other hand, in a, in, a, in a fixed price setting, they may get information rents, right? They might get additional money because they're cheaper than everybody else. And the way you solve this, typically in federal procurement, is they seem to have settled on the system of a fixed price model. So it's always the cheapest guy who gets it, but then an auction. So that 
to the extent that there are differences among contractors and how cheap they are, it's the cheapest guy who's going to be doing the job. And the amount of money they're going to earn is only the difference between the cheapest guy and the second cheapest guy. Right? So they earn some surplus, but the surplus is bounded by competition. Okay, okay so all of this, uh, this analysis has been about money. And in fact, what you're buying is typically a lot more complicated, you know, and it's, it's not all just about money. So to take a particular example, which is the example we'll be talking about today, um, you want a highway built. And one dimension is that you'd like that highway to be built cheaply. But you'd also like that highway to be built soon, right? Sooner rather than later, or repaired sooner rather than later. This is particularly true if you're thinking about something like a bridge, where the traffic delays or the externalities caused to commuters for having to drive around uh, to the other side of the river, say if you close down a mass F bridge, for example, is going to be it's going to be very very costly. And so time is going to be a very important dimension. Uh, and how so? How do you deal with this in a contracting problem? Well, typically uh, you specify a complete design. So you say this is exactly what I want, and you write that down in a contract. So I want a bridge over Mass Ave that's built by this date. And then everything becomes about money. So now we have this product. It's entirely specified what the product is. And now we're trying to find some sort of design that's going to uh, achieve this in the most cost-effective kind of way, most efficiently. But people have started to think about um, more innovative designs recently, which give people, which leave the design a little bit more flexible and give people incentives to deliver a slightly better product. So to, to be a bit more precise about this, the standard design is and with respect to time is that you set a deadline and you set a penalty rate for every day late. So that penalty rate is laid out in the contract typically. The delivery date for this is the 30th of January and every day thereafter you owe us another $5,000. Okay, we're going to pay you $5,000 less. These innovative designs uh, work in two different directions. So there are two different ways that they've been implemented. One is that you can just start giving bonuses for being early. So you know, the design we have in mind is that you're going to hit the 30th of January. But if you happen to deliver it on the 20th of January, here's some extra money to compensate you for it. And so that makes the product sort of a bit more flexible. You can deliver any product, really. You don't have to deliver the 30th of January product. You can deliver the 20th of January product or the 10th of February product. And we're going to have a contingency plan that specifies how you get paid out in each of these different uh, deliverables you might come up with. A second thing you can do, uh, which we're going to spend quite a lot of time talking about today, is you can allow people to bid directly about on the deadlines themselves. You, going back to the bidding stage, you can have people compete on both money and time, and you can award a contract to the person who's the best in terms of some combination of money and time. So no longer only about money, but really auctioning off uh, a combination of money and time. OK, so here's a sort of a, a concrete example. Um, so in 2007, there was a gas tank explosion uh, in a very big interchange in San Francisco. Um, so whenever I give this talk out in California, everybody knows what this interchange is, but I, I don't really. Um, but this is a sort of a huge explosion. As you can see, it kind of just completely messed up you know, multiple highways, uh, multiple sort of roads in that interchange. So uh, this was in Oakland. And 80,000 people a day traveled on this interchange. And so when Caltrans went ahead and estimated the externality from this, the negative externality, they basically worked out that the cost of that interchange being down was $6 million a day in terms of commuter time. Um, it caused huge traffic delays. People couldn't get where they wanted to get. There weren't that many other routes around. It was a disaster. So what Caltrans decided to do was take one of these innovative approaches. Rather than saying, uh, we'd like this contract, we'd like somebody to repair this bridge, and here's the deadline, they decided to put in place a deadline, but also give some bonuses to try to get it done a bit quicker. So the goal was that it should be done in 50 days. The cost estimate was um, 5.2 million for that to be done. And then they agreed to pay a $200,000 per day early bonus, which was capped at $2 million. You can see that's much smaller than what they thought it was worth. They thought it was worth $6 million a day. But they're paying 200000 a day. And then also a huge penalty for being late to incentivize people to, to really um, get it done on time. So does anybody have any guesses as to what happened? Yeah, they got it done in 25 days. Yeah, they got it done even quicker. They got it, yeah, well, you can see three slides ahead. OK, it was 25 exactly? You knew that? I, I didn't even know that. They didn't save any money, make any more money after that. 
Yeah, the interesting thing is they, they did it very quickly, and then they uh, and then they, in addition to that, they uh, they didn't make a ton of money off it, as you say. So the first thing is that contractor was completed in 25 days. The contractor earned the full business of $5 million, a bonus of $5 million. But what's interesting is that that bonus was entirely anticipated, and therefore it was competed away because there was an auction, right? So everybody everybody realized they were getting a $5 million bonus because they could do it in 25 days, and uh, the top three bids were all under $1.5 million. So in the end, the winning bid turned out to be $867,000. The contract cost them $5.8 million, uh, which really seemed very reasonable considering they were expecting it to cost them uh, $5.2 million anyway and only get it done in 50 days. Okay, so this was very, very successful. Um, okay, so if this is, this is a very successful project, it's a, it, it worked out really well, very high, high bonuses, very large amounts of money involved, one thing we'd like to know is whether this is sort of a, something more general. And we'd like to ask, what happens when you uh, put in place time incentives on project delivery and cost? And we're going to use a much larger data set to, to look at this. Yeah? Was it very surprising that somebody did it in 25 days? Was it surprising? I think they were surprised, yeah. So the, the design engineer genuinely thought that this was a project that had to take 50 days. Admittedly, design engineers, from what I understand, tend to build in a little bit of slack. So they always pad things a little bit you know, so that, that people come in under target rather than past targets. But I think they were, I think the 25, you know, half the time was surprising. Um, yeah. Well, this is the first uh, time they'd used high-powered incentives on the deadline. They might, their past observations might have led them to think that things take a long time. Yeah, so they, they had, um, they had had other instances of this before. I think this is the first case where the incentives had been that big. But you'll see from the stuff that I'll show you later that in fact it's, it's the 50% of the time is not even that surprising. So I think I'll show you later that uh, you get about 35% time reductions pretty routinely. Um, yeah? I mean, clearly all the contractors knew they could build it in 25 days. So I mean, that seems, you know, like. <laughs> the, so the design engineer should have been able to work that out, right? Yeah. yeah so I mean, what did this happen when they had to repair the Bay Bridge after the 1989, was it earthquake? Right. And so the, this, sort of, this should be something that was known from a while back. I mean, I think what's surprising, so let me rephrase. I think the design engineer maybe knows this, but the way the design engineer actually comes to that number of 50 days is basically to assess what a standard work crew working in a standard way on this design would take. And so they're not anticipating that, of course, given these huge incentives, people will do non-standard things. Um, and so I think that's, yeah, that's maybe one way to think about OK, so what we'd like to do is, is work out uh, how much these time incentives do to project delivery and cost. Um, compare the theory against the data to see if there are any sort of su substantive differences and to see if we can suggest any improvements uh, in contract design based on this. And so today I'm basically going to talk about two papers. Um, I'm going to spend most of the time talking about uh, this paper in California, which basically compares uh, outcomes in standard auctions uh, versus these scoring auctions where people bid on both time and money. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit at the end about Minnesota. Um, in Minnesota, we have not very much variation in incentives. In fact, all the contracts we're going to look at in Minnesota are standard contracts. What we have is very detailed production data. So we actually see every day what was happening on the site, what the contractor did, whether they showed up for work, how long they worked, how many hours it took. And so we can think a little bit about whether, there's, uh, whether the theory we have, the basic theory that we built for California, is really actually correct in light of the Minnesota data. And you'll see that there are some sort of slight differences between the two. OK, so um, California, we basically end up finding, just to highlight the findings in advance, uh, we find that the scoring auction design it seems to be a good idea. Contracts end up being completed a bit faster. And we estimate that the commuter gain uh, uh, less cost is about $5.2 million a contract. So we think that there's an average contract is about $20 million. So we think there's about 25% uh, a surplus being left on the table here. So it's a pretty pretty big number. Um, and we think, moreover, that based on this, uh, our analysis, that the way that they're using them at the moment is not enough. They could go much further. They could use these contracts far more often and, and achieve much more significant welfare gains from doing that. Um, yeah? So another alternative is to just uh, low power contract, mm -hmm. but set the deadline of 25 days. Yeah, then they'll just go late. What? Then they'll just go late. 
I mean, if, it, if it's a super low-powered contract and you set a super tight deadline, actually, it's interesting you say that. I'm not going to get to it, but in Minnesota, we simulate exactly that counterfactual. Very low penalties, very tight deadline. You just complete really late, and you pay the penalty. No, no, like high penalties, just like... Well, then you're back to a high-powered contract. And nobody okay. bids. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, nice. well, no, people bid. They just bid a lot. I'm willing to do this for a lot of money. Um, and then it actually gets you a very similar outcome. What we'll see is that there's a big difference between, um, and you see this in the theory, there's a big difference between, um, between incentives that look like quotas, here's a deadline and then here's some penalty, and incentives that look like taxes. Here's a flat rate at which I'm going to incentivize you to be quicker or slower. And you want taxes, you don't want quotas. And, and so there are actually a lot of reasons why 25, 25 days and huge penalties are a really bad idea. Um, but we'll see that a bit later. Same contract, twenty-five days and two hundred thousand dollar fine for every day. If it's, it's a bonus, time. it's if you're giving a two hundred thousand dollar bonus. Oh, as well, yeah, you could move to zero. If you so if you, if you five million bonus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So exactly a twenty-five. So if you, you yeah, so if you move to a um, if you move to a system in which basically you can create a tax with a quota, you can create a tax by basically setting a in any case a um. A deadline of zero days will always generate essentially the same incentive structure as a, as a you know as anything. And so, 25 days if they can never complete it sooner than 25 days, there's no risk in setting a 25 day thing. The, the danger is always sort of you want something that looks like a tax. So if you take the minimum possible feasible days they could complete it in, and then everything after that, uh, you're going to charge them a penalty. That's a tax effectively. If you set it sort of in the interior of what's feasible. And then there's a sudden discontinuous jump in the incentive structure, then that looks more like a quota and it's not going to be optimal. Maybe. So, so then we don't know in, in the example that you gave, we don't know if they did it a tax or a quota because it depends of whether on whether 25 days, because there was a maximum. We don't, know if it was, yeah, we don't know if it was feasible to do any better. But certainly they weren't going to do any better because we they didn't have any incentive to. Yeah. Maybe they could have done better, but yeah. Uh, so we don't know whether this, what they did before in that case was optimal or not, since we don't know what the technology is. Yeah. Yeah. I guess you get to that, but it must somehow depend on how you model uncertainty. You know? because, um, so it depends on how you think the, about the, risk. The, 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 I mean, taxes must be somehow because there's a lot of cases where I'm, you know, I have legitimate reasons why I run three days over and I don't want to like, lose all my... Yeah, so it matters a lot. So it's certainly model specific. So the way we're thinking about this is that there is a known benefit and there's an unknown cost on the contractor side. And in that case, the tax turns out to be the right, the right solution to that. We'll see in the theory, but later. Okay. Um, so Minnesota, um, we find you know that penalties work even in low-powered contracts. If you have, so all the penalties here are not very big, but some penalties are bigger than others. And when the contracts have stronger penalties, they tend to be late less often. So even at lower levels, they matter. Um, but we also find in Minnesota when we look at the production data that there are significant production shocks. Uh, so things go wrong. That's not surprising. And contractors respond to these shocks. So they respond in a bunch of different ways. Uh, the theory model that we lay out there just has a, something about them adapting how, how much they work a day, so whether they work longer hours or shorter hours. They do that, but it turns out they also work on weekends. Uh, they'll also work in the rain because one way that, uh, that these contracts are designed to, uh, to deal with risk is they say, if it's a terribly rainy day when you can't get any work done, we're not going to count that as a day. So you're not being exposed to weather risk because if it happens that you get a horrible raining season or a monsoon or something like that, that's not going to count against you. Um, but it turns out that, in fact, on days in which there's light rain, the project engineer might say, that doesn't count as a real day. That's OK. And then they go and work on it anyway uh, because they can get some work done and they don't get charged for it. Right? So we see all these interesting kinds of adaptation uh, to the, the shocks under the different incentives. And one thing that comes out of this is because we measure significant production shocks, we can see that when you have high-powered incentives, you really are genuinely transferring risk to the contractor. It's not like the contractor can say, there's a technology, there's a fixed technology, you give me different incentives, I'm going to return a different amount of days I'm willing to work, do this contract, contract in. They can change how they're going to approach the task, but they still face risk because there are these shocks. And so if you're going to ramp up the incentives, then you know, there's going to be risk because their payments are going, to, uh, are going to vary a lot. And so that suggests that relative to the Caltrans analysis, where I'm going to ignore risk aversion, um, 
risk aversion actually is probably realistic, and so welfare gains may be a little bit smaller than I would have told you with the, with the California data. Okay. So what I'm going to do is uh, start off the California, tell you a little bit about the data, talk a little bit about the program evaluation, and, and go through the model and some kind of actual simulations, and then a little bit about Minnesota at the end. So in California, we have uh, a large data set, most of which is publicly available on their website. Um, so we have the contract plans and specifications. Uh, this includes basically the entire contract itself, which is a multi-hundred, you know, it's many hundreds of pages PDFs, parts of which different RAs have to go through. Um, we have a bid summary, so it's basically what everybody bid on each of these projects. And we have the payments to the contractors, uh, which include the completion dates, it includes measures of when they started, when they finished, how many weather days they were given, how many other kinds of days were given to them as special days that they didn't get charged, et cetera. And we have this data between 2003 and 2008. Question? Yeah. So bid summaries means uh, you have information on all bids, whether they won or not. Exactly. OK. And that's actually going to be important for us, because we're going to learn something from all the bids rather than just a single bid in the, in the estimation later. OK, so a standard design basically says that there's a target date specified by the design engineer and there's damages. The scoring auction design, as we already said, is something where you bid on both price and time. And in fact, they have a very particular kind of linear scoring rule. Uh, you bid an amount of money. That's the A part of this A plus B design. And then there's a user cost, which is a parameter. And that user cost times B uh, gives your score S. And the person who has the lowest score wins the auction. Okay, and then there are additionally damages uh, specified in the contract. So this is an example of a particular uh, contract, and this is actually, you know, this is a piece of data, right? So this is a, a text file that you can download from their website. So um, it's a particular contract that's it's at multiple locations. They're doing work uh, to replace the existing median barrier in a bunch of different places. And uh, there are many bidders, so I haven't shown you all the bids, but here are the top two. So De Silva Gates is the winning bidder. They bid about $10.8 million, and they said they'd be willing to do it in 108 days. The user cost parameter here is 11,500, so that's how much a day is worth in dollars. And so then that gets multiplied by the 108, it gets added together, and the A plus B score is $12.1 million. Uh, O.C. Jones and Sons was willing to do it for a little bit more money, but in a lot fewer days, in 135 days, so they really weren't nearly as competitive. They end up being about $300,000 behind on the, on the score. Okay. So this is basically how an A plus B auction works. Everybody's going to submit a bid and a number of days. And then we just take this, uh, we just take this linear score and take it, give it to the lowest scorer. Okay. So A plus B contracts are used pretty systematically in California. One reason we, we worked with California is it's a big state. They, they, they do a lot of these uh, road contracts. And in fact, They've embraced this A plus B design, so it's pretty common there. Um, in most districts, they have a rule for when you use an A plus B contract. They use them if the value of the contract is over $5 million and the estimated cost to commuters is over $5,000 a day. So it has to be a big contract, otherwise they don't bother. And it has to be a contract where they really think that the road closure is going to be bad for commuters. However, and this is, it's very useful for us, but it's a little bit puzzling. One of the districts, which is San Francisco, basically just has a completely different rule that they use because whoever's in charge of District 4 wants to do things differently. And their rule is that if the contract is over 100 days, just as a flat rule, they'll use the A plus B design. Yeah? Does that mean they, that if that's, always, if that's true, they always use a scoring rule, or they, if that's just when they can use it? No, they, they, they um, so let me rephrase. They, the right thing is they can use it. So they don't always use it. Um, but they never use it if it's below 100, okay, is, the, yeah. is the right statement. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Um, so if the A plus B contract is used, then uh, how they set user costs is also a little bit random. In outside of District 4, every, basically the traffic department goes ahead and calculates what they think the cost to commuters of this delay is. And it turns out that the way they calculate it, at least by our calculations, always seems to be unreasonably low. So somehow they come up with numbers that make it seem like people's time isn't very valuable. We're not, we really, we've tried very hard to reconcile our numbers and their numbers, and we're just pretty much convinced that their numbers are unreasonably low. Um, 
And uh, in, in District 4, they just have a formula. So they don't even try to work out how much traffic is going through these, uh, these different areas. They just literally apply the formula, and that gives a, a user cost. Yeah. What's the relationship between this story and the $5 million a day versus $200,000 a day on the freeway? Great. So, so this is going to be a different design, at least on its face. It looks like uh, it, should be, it should be quite different. We're now bidding out on a deadline rather than getting a contract which pays a penalty. In theory, for a lot of theory models you write down, they're completely equivalent. It doesn't matter. You could have turned the one model into the other and it shouldn't make any difference. I think an interesting empirical question is whether, in fact, they do behave the same in practice. I know I've seen papers from lab experiments which suggest that, uh, that they do perform pretty similarly, but the lab experiments are set up in such a way that it, it looks like they're going to end up performing pretty similarly. So. I don't know how much I believe those results. But at least in principle, if you can work your way through it, you should be indifferent between a contract that's going to pay you, you know, $250,000 a day or one in which it's valued in the auction at $250,000 a day. Yeah? Uh, the penalty is equal to the user cost? The penalty is equal to the user cost in these contracts. Um, the user cost is made up. And the user cost is... Speaking. But yeah, so there have been cases where the penalty has been less than the user cost. That's a terrible idea because then your optimal decision is to bid zero days and then pay the penalty. And in fact, that happened in Minnesota, uh, and they, everybody called the contractors called the people up and said, "Can we bid zero days?" And they said no. And so then they bid 20 days when it was a 100-day contract. Um, whatever they thought they could get away with without being disqualified. It's sort of a little random. Yeah. Platoon's other question is: Are there some kind of reputational incentives from being able to bid accurately about you? an accurate estimate of the time? So no is the, is the short answer. You'd think there would be. Um, and at least according to federal procurement rules, you have to award it based on either the score in the auction, you know, whether it's a scoring auction or a normal auction. And so really, as long as you actually deliver, you can't really be penalized. Now, that being said, um, the state could, in principle, try to bar you from an auction. They could say, you're not, not a reliable contractor anymore. You didn't deliver. That's potentially going to lead to lawsuits. So you probably have some sort of reputational concerns, but not as much as you'd think, because the state is going to be very uh, nervous about trying to disqualify anybody. Yeah? So here, if the 108 days guy wins, and he finishes in 100 days, he does not get any bonus. No. No. So even here, if, if there's no reputational effect, you would expect them so it should be sort of a dominant strategy to bid zero days or something that's below the support of the uncertainty set over. Yeah, that's right. So you'd expect that, why don't I just go ahead and go with zero and then always pay out penalties? Uh, so people don't do that. In fact, what you'll see them do in the data is they almost always basically pick a target they think they can hit and they pretty much hit it. Um, you know, so maybe that suggests that the uncertainty is not as much as you'd think. Uh, Although the evidence from Minnesota would say that there is some genuine uncertainty about this. Uh, so it is, it is curious as to why they don't just pick more ambitious targets and go late. Uh, well, the contractors, not game theorists. <laughs> well, there is that. But they did work out the Minnesota. They did work out the, uh, the, you know, the, the edge of the support thing. Anyway, yeah. Um, so they may lose money if I bid zero and I can do the contract in 80 days and somebody bid honestly on 50 days, then I'm going to win but pay the second highest price and then actually lose a lot of money. No, but what you do is you, you bid zero and you ramp up your bid at the same time. So your you, 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 you know you're going to complete in 80 days. So you know you're going to complete in, going to pay 80 days more penalties. So you just add those 80 days more penalties to your bid. It's exactly the same amount. So yeah, it's exactly the same amount. So you're equally competitive as before, but now you're guaranteed to lock in the bonus because you're always going to be late. So if you happen to get lucky and be able to do it in 70 days, then whereas if you'd bid 80, you wouldn't have got a bonus if you'd done it in 70. Now you're always going to be late. So, you've, you, yeah. so there's a lot of like little cute little game theory kind of things you could do here. But they, in practice, people just basically go with what they think they're going to be able to do it in um, uh, because they're going to make more money that way. OK. Um, OK, so actually what I'd like to ask is a, is, a, is a sort of more of an econometric question to start, which is just, we'll come back to the theory, but it's just sort of does this, does this, uh, does this program seem to have good outcomes? And so one way to do that is uh, to basically look at some set of outcome variables and compare a treatment and a control group. So we're going to construct a control group of standard contracts that are like the contracts that got treated. So a treatment here is being given an A plus B assignment. You're an A plus B auction. And a control is an auction, is an auction that, or a contract 
that could have been a plus b, so it's pretty similar, but for some reason was not a plus b, and we hope that that reason is orthogonal to uh, the outcomes of interest. Okay, and uh, so what we're going to get is treatment effects of bids on on bids. So how much more do people bid, and time to completion. So how much longer does this contract take? We expect that A plus B contracts cost you more money because you're asking people to be faster, so that should cost them money, so you should end up paying more on average. So we'd like to see that effect, and we'd also like to see that they do end up actually being faster, that they get completed more quickly. And then we need to, to compare these numbers in dollars, we need to convert time to money. So we have to say, what's the commuter time worth uh, in order to be able to compare the acceleration in time to the amount of money you're paying out in addition. So to convert time into money, we do something really simple. Um, we basically say that the, the loss to commuters per day on a highway is the value of their time, which we assess at about $12 an hour, a little bit more because some roads have trucks and we think the trucks, uh, the value of, de of delaying a truck is a little bit higher, so we assess that $28 an hour. Um, times the amount of traffic going through that road, uh, times the delay, uh, where we assume that the delay is basically three minutes. We do a more elaborate calculation, but you should, to rough approximation, we're just going to say that we assume that every time something goes over that road, it gets delayed three minutes if it's under construction. Okay. Um, and so that gives us a, an amount of money uh, per day. Okay. And this is pretty conservative. So we certainly don't think three minutes delay is about the right number. We think that three minutes delay is probably a lower bound for many of these contracts. And so we're really just taking a very conservative uh, estimate of what we think the social loss is. Okay, how about constructing a control group? So to do that, we basically follow the policy rule. So we know that there are some contracts that were eligible for A plus B. So this goes back to your earlier question, right? So uh, if you were over uh, $5 million outside of District 4, you could be an A plus B contract. If you were over 100 days outside of just, uh, in District 4, you could be an A plus B contract. So we're going to compare contracts that are at least big enough or at least long enough, uh, but for some reason weren't A plus B. And we're going to see if those two uh, groups look pretty similar. So this is what you get. So here in this column, I'm comparing standard contracts, this column, to A plus B contracts, that column. And you'll see that uh, the winning bid in both of those contracts is pretty similar. The discount from the engineer's estimate is pretty similar. The number of bidders is pretty similar. The amount of time expected for the contract to take is, is pretty similar as well. What's different across these two contract groups, the ones that were standard and the ones that were A plus B, is things like traffic. So there's way more traffic on the ones that ended up being A plus B contracts. Um, uh, it turns out that one measure of how valuable the, 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 um, the traffic department assesses them as being um, for commuters is something called the reopening penalty. So the reopening penalty is basically a penalty that gets assessed if you don't reopen the contract during peak hour traffic. So suppose 5 to 7 p.m. is peak hour traffic. Part of the contract will say, you cannot work between 5 and 7 p.m., and if you're late, I'm going to charge you this penalty. And it's usually per 15 minutes. It's like $5,000 every 15 minutes you're late. So it's a very high penalty. Um, and it turns out that in the A plus B contracts, these penalties are much higher. So the story we're, we'd like to tell here is, look, these contracts are pretty much identical, except for the fact that these are contracts that, for whatever reason, are viewed as more socially valuable, which is why they got assigned to be A plus B. And so, uh, our analysis here is going to basically depend on the assumption that contracts that are more socially valuable are not more difficult to accelerate, right? So that the, the differences in costs across these two groups, how fast you can accelerate them, are not related to the differences in, in how socially valuable they are, because that's what's driving assignment here. Does that make sense? You have a question? Oh. Okay. Um, so like, are those the same kind of roads just different traffic on them? Like yeah, that's, I mean, that, that's pretty much what we can show you. So on many, on many things, it's true. We also, do the, um, we also do it on types of projects, so what, whether it's a repaving contract or a bridge repair contract, et cetera. And the answer is, again, that we're reasonably balanced on those groups. So it looks like these are the same kinds of contracts, except for traffic. That makes sense because the rules are basically such that they should be the same kind of, um, the same kind of thing, except for traffic, right? This $5,000 a day rule. Okay. In, in here, in District 4, it's a little bit more puzzling, right? Why are there any contracts that are on A plus B? And the answer is that District 4 believes that um, uh, some contracts are harder to, uh, so they don't make some contracts A plus B because they think that um, they're going to have difficulties themselves in getting permissions for various parts of the contract. So like if you're building through a farm, 
you need to get permission from the farmer, or you, you know, when you're close to a farm, you need to get permission from the farmer to do that. If they don't have their permissions lined up in advance, they just don't use A plus B. They don't like using high-powered incentives when they don't already have all the clearances in place. Um, so that's, that's the story of District 4. But at least for the other districts, it's pretty clear what's going on. There are some contracts they don't think it's very valuable. There are others where they do. Okay. So, um, so what do we do? We just run OLS regressions. We look at the outcomes on a dummy for A plus B status, con controlling for a bunch of observables. And since the treatment control groups are already balanced in the observables, this is, they say, doubly robust, right? It's robust because you're controlling for observables which are already balanced on. Okay. Um, okay, so what do you find? You find that uh, here, uh, you find that basically people bid to complete the contract in about 40% fewer days. So this is kind of a huge result already. So 100-day contract, your average person, average one of these cases, people will be bidding to complete it in 60 days. Okay, so it's a big reduction. Um, and they're going to charge you about 8% more for it. So the contract price does rise, and it rises by about 8%. You might think that part of this reduction in days is an illusion because maybe they actually complete it, say they're going to complete it in 40% fewer days, but they don't. Uh, and you know, depending on how you cut the data, it, it appears to basically hold up. So they don't complete it in 40% fewer days. They end up completing it on time, but a standard contract would have been completed about 5% early anyway. So the actual gain in time is about 35%, not 40%. So they end up doing what they said they'd do, but you would have already got 5% for free if you had written a, written a standard contract. So you only actually are getting up about 35% faster. Uh, the change in commuter welfare from this is about $5.6 million a contract. And the change in cost, it turns out to be about $1 million. So there's a large, uh, a large gain on a per contract basis. Sort of 5 million minus a million is about 4.6 million. Okay, so that's, that's basically the idea here. We do a lot of uh, robustness checks, which I'm not going to talk too much about in the paper. One thing you could do is you could say, well, this linear regression is too simple. I should really match uh, more carefully. So we do nearest neighbor matching. We basically pair contracts based on the observables in a sort of nearest neighbor sense. And then we, we difference them. And we find that there's no real change in the results. Uh, and the other thing we can do is we can do a, um, a regression discontinuity design around these thresholds, these 100-day thresholds and these $5 million thresholds. And again, we find significant results. OK, okay so um, the next question you might want to ask is, could they have done any better? So they, they did pretty well uh, with these scoring auctions. Um, uh, and obviously, they've, they've continued the program, so they thought it was a good program. Um, could they have done any better? So now we come to the theory. So what should they have done in theory is the question. Yeah. So I have a question about, about how you think about welfare. Uh, is it the case that these contractors are working on several highways at the same time and diverting resources between them so that you might actually just be some, seeing substitution away from the, from the standard contract? Yeah, that's model? a great question. Uh, so, uh, you know, one, we, w that would be a good thing to check for. Uh, we haven't checked for that. Uh, and um, we'll s in Minnesota, we've had a look at this. In Minnesota, we find no evidence of people moving things across contracts. But in Minnesota, we don't have the same sort of variation in incentives. So we don't have like huge incentives, small incentives. You might think that what's going on is, yeah, sometimes it's huge, sometimes it's small. Um, I, yeah, I mean, the short answer is we should just check. I don't think that's I mean, what's I, going I, on. Even if they are doing that, I suppose you, you have the sort of right order of magnitude for the welfare in the sense that it's the less important contracts that are getting the weaker incentives. Yeah, that's right. So already you're in the right direction. but. Um, I actually just don't think it's what's going on, to be honest. I think that, I, I mean, I'm, I, I'm happy to look for it. But, I, I, uh, you know, the, the, what we're seeing, the, what you, I guess you would expect to be seeing the data then is that there are a lot of late standard contracts going on. And the standard contracts are pretty much finishing on time. So it doesn't look like there's just a sort of massive rearrangement. It looks like there's genuinely just, um, and the way they describe it, so there's a, there was a New York Times article about this. The people who do these very accelerated contracts basically say, look, we just changed the plans completely. So you said you were going to do it on this plan. We have a completely different plan. We negotiate uh, better deals with our input suppliers so they can get our suppliers, uh, supplies more quickly. Right? So it's already about a reorganization of the way they're going to uh, produce the thing more than just a, you know, a movement of like, well, I had a crane here. I could put that crane here, and then this one gets slower. Right? Um, Cement. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, I actually had a question. So, so I mean, the, the so punchline that oh, you know, you're costing you know a million dollars more 
to the government, but you're saving the people, you know, overall net welfare, whatever amount. I mean, you could say this, that look, all it takes is a school, you know, a public school system to invest $2 million in better schools, and the effect to the population down the road will be, you know, $50 million. So, you know, clearly we should do this. But the point is, at the end of the day, you know, California does need to come and say, hey guys, look, we've saved you a bunch of money getting your roads fixed faster. Um, can we have more taxes? That's right. So and the answer is always like, you know. So I have two responses to that. So one response is sort of like. California, it's always no, but yeah. We don't really know what the effects of like of, of, of investing in schools are and people yeah, spend yeah. forever measuring these things. Sure, sure. So it's a sort of a useful thing to do. But um, actually we're gonna do something useful here with that respect. We're gonna ask, um, one thing we're gonna ask is what could they have done if they didn't wanna change the amount of money they had spent? And we'll find that they could have actually not changed the amount of money spent and done a whole lot better. And so that maybe gets to your question. Um, yeah. Are there different, um, so for the, for the two different kinds of auctions, are there different contractors bidding on the two different auctions in the sense that Maybe if I'm like a really slow contractor, Excellent. I know I don't bid on the squirt auction because I can never get the, I, I know I can't be, I can't honestly get my days down enough to. Yes, yeah, so the, the short answer to that is no, as far as we can tell, in the sense that um, nothing about contractor observables predicts where they bid. So we run a, we run a, we run a, a basically a participation regression where it's a dummy for whether you participate in an auction. We ask, is there something about uh, the, is there something about the observable features of that contractor that predict that they'd have bid in different kinds of auctions. So for example, the big big contractors always bid in A plus B auctions, or the closest contractor always bid in A plus B auction. And the answer is no. So there could be selection and observables. It could be that some people are selectively better at accelerating, but at least that's not in the, sort of the, what we can observe about them. Can you look at something like the, pat, the time they take in the past? I mean, maybe this, this is this. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, if we had a normal panel, I guess we could, yeah. So I mean, you have like five years, right? So could you take like the first, the first half and look at their their time. To then. completion and see if those are the people. Yeah, that's right. That, I mean, that's an observable, so we could certainly look at it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like, how much of the uncertainty is, is uh, foreseen by the contractor and how much of that is just private information? Uh, so that's a good question. So we haven't got to, um, yeah, so maybe they'll, they'll probably belong better with the Minnesota stuff, but the short answer is not really, right? So what we're going to see is, uh, um, so I can, show you, I can show you in Minnesota that there are weather shocks. And I can show you that those weather shocks affect how long the contract takes, even after you account for the free days that you get because it's rainy. So there, there certainly is residual uncertainty. I just can't predict what the weather is, and the weather matters. Yeah. Um, but how much of it is which one and the other, I don't know. There could be other things. Like, I mean, uh, any big construction project, there's some, like, you know, unforeseen things. Like, you know, I might need a better foundation. Oh, yeah. Which adds some more days. And, you know, that's something I probably, you know, wouldn't want to... Put into, I mean, I probably wouldn't want to put all the risk on the contractor because the contractors are smaller than the government. Right? No, exactly. So, so it doesn't seem efficient. That's right. So the in the in the Minnesota paper, we basically so you're right. So firstly, there's there's stuff that the contractor knows that we don't know, and there's stuff that the contractor didn't know that's going to be realized. That's a genuine sort of shock to them. We're going to basically end up assuming in the Minnesota stuff that that basically we know everything the contractor knows. So everything we that isn't observed is a shock to them. And we're going to find that those shocks do matter in the sense that they, if, you, if you really put high part incentives, you'd impose quite a lot of risk on them. And so you know, both of these end up going in the same direction. If I can't raise a lot of money because I'm the government and it's hard to raise money, then I don't want to tax people, then I shouldn't use very high powered incentives. I should use some sort of more moderate incentives. And also, if there's a huge amount of uncertainty that isn't resolved, then I don't want to use super high powered incentives because, again, it's going to impose risk. And so both of these statements are going to go in the direction of saying, yes, you want to use incentives, and yes, you want those incentives to be sort of moderately powered. And that's, that's sort of where we're going to end up at the end of the day. Um, OK. So, um, so what should they have done in theory uh, is, is, is reasonably easy to answer. Um, every day taken is going to impose a negative externality uh, on the commuters. And so. Uh, what you basically want to do is you want to make the, the contractor internalize that externality. And so all you do is if the externality is $3,000 a day, you basically say, I'll penalize you $3,000 a day. I'll tax you at every $3,000 a day you, you uh, bid. And that basically makes their objective function coincide with the social objective function. OK, so this is a, an easy solution. Um, on the other hand, uh, the standard kind of contract isn't doing that. So 
this is sort of the picture I have in mind, at least with respect to the standard contract. So here is a contractor cost curve. And this C prime means that it's the marginal cost of accelerating by a day, so manipulating the amount of time they take by one day in either direction or the other. We imagine that it's uh, very, uh, you know, accelerating by a day is very cheap at the beginning, but very, very expensive. So if you want to reduce from 30 days to 31, from 31 days to 30 days, that's not so expensive, but from two days to one days would be insanely expensive because you'd have to do a lot more work very quickly. Um, these thetas here are just sort of different types of the contractors. This goes back to a world in which all the asymmetric information is ex ante, right? So this is something that the contractor knows about themselves that you don't know. This is their different contract, uh, contractor cost curves. So in a standard contract, there's a deadline, and the penalties just jump uh, to some penalty rate at that point. And so one thing you get from uh, a standard contract is that you might have different contractor types who are nonetheless all going to complete at the exact same dates. So they're all going to pile up or bunch at the deadline. And the reason is that uh, you know, the most uh, efficient contractor, theta 1 here, has no incentive to be early. The most inefficient contractor doesn't really want to be late because he's suddenly have to pay those high penalties that so all these people end up bunched in the middle doing the exact same thing. That's not efficient. Um, whereas with an A plus B contract, there's some constant user cost, which basically provides a flat incentive and what these guys are going to want to do is, uh, is basically work out where this user cost cuts their modular cost of delay, uh, cost of acceleration curve, and bid that number of days. So where this, where this point, these two curves cut each other is, is what they're actually going to bid. They're going to say, look, uh, given, that you, given that it's $3,000 a day, I, I wouldn't want to accelerate more than 10 days, but I will accelerate 10 days. The target was 80 days, so I'll bid 70 days. Okay? Sorry, I was confused by that picture because you said that in these contracts, typically the disincentive is actually a lot lower than the user cost, right? Oh, yes. Uh, no. So the, the disincentive is usually equal to the user cost. So okay. this picture oh, should the, be done uh, there. It's, it's equal to the, and the authority's measure of the user cost, which is maybe different from the actual. Oh, from the social cost. Yeah, yeah. So that's right. So, so think about this as being the actual user cost. This is the weight in the rule. This is the penalty rate, which can be equal to that. And then there's a social cost, which we think is actually somewhere way up here, much, much higher. And all I'm going to say in the theory is that you know, the user cost should be set equal to the social cost. If it's set low the social cost, you're going to get inefficiently low acceleration. Um, but yeah, so we haven't got the social cost anywhere in this picture. OK, so the right level, as we just said, the user cost should be set equal to the social cost. OK, and so you know, that's the theory. That's, so theory is really simple. The theory, uh, you know, relative to what Marcus was saying before, we have no ex post uncertainty. We have no risk aversion. So if we assume risk neutrality, then you know, adding ex post uh, uncertainty doesn't really matter too much. If we assume risk aversion plus ex post uncertainty, then the incentives should be lower than these incentives. Right? That, that would be too strong in that case. Okay. Okay, so then the second question you want to ask is how much better off would society be if you used these optimal scoring auctions? Um, so to get welfare estimates, you actually have to go and estimate the contractor cost. So somehow, what I don't know at the moment is what this cost curve looks like, what the costs of acceleration actually are. Um, and even more, it's a little bit more complicated. If I want to run a counterfactual, I have to say, suppose I were to change the incentive structures in all these auctions. Who would show up in these auctions? Would it change who ends up in these auctions? And who would win these auctions? Uh, which, again, is you know, it's obviously who bids the lowest, but I have to have a model of bidding to work out who's going to bid the lowest. Okay, so this is kind of complicated. And we're going to end up modeling the entire auction process. But because I have 10 minutes, I'm not going to tell you about all of that. I'm just going to tell you mainly about how we estimate the costs. So one thing we do is we write down a parametric form for this function that I was showing you before, this curve. So we assume that the marginal cost of acceleration, which we know is going to be set equal to the user cost in equilibrium, has a very particular form. In particular, we assume that it's, uh, it's got this log linear form where the number of days they offer to accelerate to raise to some power alpha is going to determine their marginal cost of acceleration. Um, and so. These are the kinds of curves we're going to have in mind, very similar to what I showed you before. It's going to be convex, where the convexity is going to be determined by this parameter alpha. OK, so what I can do is that I can take that equation, I can take logs and rearrange terms. And when I do, I get that something that I observed, uh, which is the amount of days they accelerated, was a function of something else I observed, which was the user cost on this contract, as well as a bunch of controls. 
And so this is basically like estimating a supply curve in economics. If I if I um, if I offer a, if I offer exogenously a different series of prices to people, and I observe how much they're willing to supply at different prices, I can trace out that curve. So here's the same logic. I have a lot of different user costs being offered to people, different incentives for acceleration. I see how much they offer to accelerate. Okay, and that's basically the identification argument. So here, I'm basically just showing that in pictures. As the incentives go up, as I'm offering you different user costs, I'm going to see different amounts of days bid. And that's going to tell me something about uh, the shape of this curve. And then also, because I have many bidders in every auction, I can learn something about the amount of heterogeneity. So at any given user cost, I'm going to see, in any given auction, for example, I'm going to see many different bids. And so that's going to tell me something about the distribution of, uh, of uh, these cost curves across people. Right? So I can learn both about the shape generally, and I can learn something about the, uh, the heterogeneity between people. Okay, okay so you know, when, when I go and estimate that, I can estimate that actually by OLS. It's not very complicated. I have a lot of controls. I have a lot of fixed effects. But basically, what I end up getting is a, is a parameter uh, on this log user cost of about 0.275. And to interpret that, uh, that tells you that the elasticity of acceleration with respect to incentives is about 0.275, which means that the marginal costs of acceleration have the form roughly d to the 3.5. In other words, saving you one day, pretty cheap, two days, it's sort of a, it's greater than a cubic function. So the cost of acceleration got very, very, very fast. Okay? So we have extremely convex marginal cost of acceleration. It's really easy to get people to accelerate a few days, but if you want to accelerate a lot of days, that's really expensive. And so that, what that suggests is that if you set small incentives, that can have pretty big effects on completion time, right? So if I have a very convex function, means that if I set a small incentive, I can get many days out of you. I can get even more days by setting a, a bigger incentive, but the gains to bigger incentives are diminishing very fast, right? They go away pretty quickly. And so with budget constraints, I'm going back to the budget constraint point, it would be better to give small incentives in many contracts rather than giving very big incentives in very few contracts. Right, because uh, I'm going to get these gains uh, across the board, and I'm going to get them pretty cheaply from just doing it in a in a few uh, in at small levels in many contracts. Okay, so to get at that, we simulate four counterfactual policies. One of them is we keep the set of A plus B contracts exactly the same, but we change the incentives. We said that the user costs were way too low; they should be equal to social costs. So we just change the incentives and make them bigger. A second is to uh, use them only for contracts with social cost above 100K. Uh, so only to use them for really, really important contracts. The third thing is to expand the set of A plus B contracts to all contracts. So to basically change the, the world quite a lot and move to every contract being a scoring auction contract with the efficient incentives. And the fourth is this budget policy where we expand the set of contracts to everything, but only set small incentives. So incentives here are going to be 10% of the social costs, so very, very low. And I can show you many things, but uh, I think the bottom line is the easiest, which is that it doesn't really matter whether we take the same set of contracts and change the incentives. Uh, so why is that? Well, it turns out the incentives were too small before, so I can raise the incentives. But when I raise the incentives on a very convex cost curve, since the incentives were pretty big already, I'm going to get a slightly better day, you know, slightly, slightly faster contracts, and I'm going to get a slight gain. But I'm going to be raising commuter costs, uh, contractor costs by a lot. Right? They're going to pay out a lot of costs to get this little gain. In the end, the net social benefit is positive, but it's not great. I'm going to get a massive benefit from just expanding the set of contracts. So instead of using all the contracts as A plus B contracts, it's going to do much, much better. And I'm going to get most of that benefit, even if I have a much smaller uh, uh, if, I have a, if I'm only using 10% of the social cost as the incentive, right? So I don't need a, I don't need the fully efficient uh, incentive structure to get most of the benefits. And so I think of this as being sort of the main punchline of the paper. It's something you could have got, the numbers you couldn't have got ex ante, but the, the, um, the idea you could have got ex ante, right? You could have basically just said, well, if I assume a convex curve, then obviously the right thing to do is expand to everything at a smaller level if I want to maintain a budget constraint. You could have shown that pretty easily, yeah. So, so, but as with the restriction that I have to have linear, linear penalty, right? I could have. I, I could, yes, I, you if could I can in fact. If I their supply, I can actually do a much smarter penalty. Uh, small for a, for a kind of. So, 
And the, the problem here is that I pay a lot if I increase the, the bonus, I pay a lot even for the few days that I, that I would have gained for a smaller bonus. Right, that's kind of the... Yeah, yeah, exactly. That I can't, that I can't yeah. squeeze even more money. That I can't, I can't price discriminate. Essentially, so I can't price discriminate exactly on your curve. Yeah, yeah, that's but right. They, they seem to have done the opposite with the California one. They gave you like bonus for up to twenty-five days and then nothing. Yeah, in that one example. They said like give a smaller bonus at the beginning and for a, for a little bit in advance and then bigger yeah. bonus. Yeah, that's right. So you, you, yeah, you could give it like a non-linear. You give a non-linear schedule and you could, in principle, squeeze out every more. I guess even more. I guess if you knew exactly what the shape of these curves were. So that, yeah. Well, then you can just add steps if you don't know for sure, as opposed to one step, right? Yes. If you know that it's convex. If yeah. you know it's convex, you can kind of add a little bit. I guess the place that you're. But if I can bid on, if I can bid on the number of days, wouldn't I just bid a really long number of days and then? You have to set a penalty schedule that was yeah, related to your very complicated. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. So there's a question: is, yeah, whether you could do better than a linear, a linear so, rule here. I'm not sure. So, like bidders may bid this away, even if you, even if you tailor the bid, like the, a convex cost, a non-convex cost. Like it, it matters whether there's heterogeneity between bidders on the, on the schedule, on the convexity exactly. of the cost schedule. Because if there's not, they just bid like. Then it, you get it all back. It just gets better. Yeah, I mean, so here we think there's heterogeneity. We think that it looks, you know, we, we have a model where it looks kind of like this, right? So. Um, like, the other question is like, after you run you run this for a few years, you actually learn something about what is the more correct like time uh, for completion. Yes. So after you have a bit more information about the correct time for completion, do you still want to have an AB contract, or do you just want to have a regular contract but with a? It's nothing wrong with an AB contract, at least the way we've set it up here. Um, I mean, it doesn't it doesn't barely creates any admi additional administrative costs. It, it, you may as well run it, and the. The question is just is that if there's if there's some residual uncertainty, you still want to have this kind of contract. If you really thought there was no, if you thought there was no asymmetric information left, you'd basically just say I'm going to compute the efficient time. I'm going to write it into a contract and then assess penalties. But if you just don't know what it is, then. Did, yeah. did you say that cost went up on the, under AB contracts? Yeah, cost go up. Cost go so, up by about a million dollars a contract. So it it may be that like if there's. Uh, if there's another heterogeneity, another dimension of heterogeneity between contractors, then the valuations are going to be further apart under AB contract than under a standard contract. And therefore, they're going to get more, like, more banks out of yes. the auction. So this is one of the complicated things yeah, that we sort of discussed in the back end of the paper. So it depends on whether you think that, if you think the contractor's type is something about how cheap they are and how fast they are, it depends whether fast and cheap are positively or negatively correlated. So if they're positively correlated, you're sort of enhancing their market power. If they're negatively correlated, you're, you're decreasing the market power. Um, and I think we actually find in the paper that they are positively correlated. I forget. We, we actually have a finding on this in the paper. I, I forget which one it is, but we come up with a number and we said, look, it appears that these things are, I want to say they're positively correlated. So there is additional market power going to these guys. And, but it, it's still very small relative to the gains to commuters. So let me, I've got, I'm really out of time. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just show you like a picture from Minnesota. I think I'm going to, then I'm going to conclude. Okay, so in um, Minnesota, one thing we can do to try and get at this question of, you know, what is a shock? How much is unanticipated? Is to say, look, we know a lot about these contracts. We know what the design engineer knew. Uh, we know how many hours the design engineer expected the contract to take. We know what kind of contract it is. We have our RAs go through and classify thing every, everything very carefully. We know, um, we know how many days it was supposed to take. We know what the engineer's estimate was. We've got a, a bunch of observables. And so we basically regress the total number of hours that these guys ended up working on the job. And that's something unusual to be able to measure, to actually see how much effort somebody put in in a sort of a principal agent setting. This is how much they worked. And we regress that on everything we know about the contract. And we come up with this measure of a shock. And the shock is in hours per day, so that's the normalization. So this is the difference between the hours that it actually ended up taking and the best possible guess we can get of the hours it should have taken. Um, and that shock turns out to be pretty big. So most contracts, it's sort of about zero, um, but it can be as big as sort of 10 hours a day, that this contract on the end was really you know, 10 hours a day more work than you would have expected. That's a, that's a, that's a big, big shock. 
And what's interesting is that if you then compare this to the graph of days late, something is sort of super obvious from the graph, which is that uh, many things are completed exactly on time. And if anything, there's mass that you would have expected to see if, if people weren't adapting at all uh, on the right-hand side that seems to have been shifted to the left-hand side. So basically what's going on is I've got incentives to complete on time. I have no incentives to complete early. And so when I'm on this side of the shock, I get a positive shock. I don't do anything about it. When I'm on this side of the shock, I get a negative shock. I actually, I actually pile up on completing on time. Yeah. Do they know they're being observed? Yes. So I, I would just, are there, is there any, if they think there's a reputation effect, wouldn't they maybe be working closer to the deadline then? Yeah, so there, there are two things. So one is a reputation effect. We still don't think that's important here. But the other thing is you might think that they're manipulating the project engineer, which is one thing we're trying to look into. So is there a question with the, you know, this, this effect is just that you're running behind, so you really convince the project engineer to give you a few more free days. Um, and, and we're trying to see if that's the case. Um, you know, we know that they do a lot of kinds of different ways of adapting. They work in different ways, but um, anyway. So what is the punchline of this? Well, the punchline of this is, look, there's, there's, there are these shocks. They're pretty big. That imposes risk. And so in the back end of this paper, which we're not going to talk about, we actually try to again get, go through the counterfactual simulations. And we find that under the, uh, the full, an average $1.3 million contract, when you imply the correct social incentives, the standard deviation of their payments is about $50,000. And that's pretty big, because if you think that their markup is about 10%, so making about $130,000 on a contract, that means that if they get a one standard deviation uh, shock, they're going to basically uh, lose about a third of their profits. And so if you're risk averse and you're a contractor, that may not be a gamble you're willing to take. In particular, we'd be worried small companies might not be willing to take this. So we'd be worried about barriers to entry for small companies. So um, both of these. You know, both these papers seem to come to similar conclusions. One, these incentives work, uh, and I think that's more carefully shown in the, in the California case. In the Minnesota case, we don't have that many, much variation. But two, you might want to be very careful about whether you, you want to go all the way to sort of whatever the fully social optimal incentives are or something a lot more moderate. Uh, moderate incentives are going to damp these risk problems. They're also going to damp budgetary problems. Uh, they may be more practical for all kinds of reasons. But maybe then Itai's idea is not so, I mean, would be interesting, you know, as a counterfactual because you might, you know, by, by giving moderate penalties for like a few days above and below, giving, you know, higher penalties for being, being far above or far below. That's right. So you could, you, you might could, do better then. You might, you might be able to just, I mean. Because 40 days, like, you know, 100 days versus 60 days is a big difference, right? That doesn't it's a very seem big to difference. be like captured by this uh, deviation of 10 days more or less. Yeah, so, I mean, that's an interesting question, right? It, you know, it's, uh, we, can, we can certainly enrich the contracting space and allow them to write more complicated contracts. And then, yeah, it's just basically about heterogeneity. It's whether, you know, because in, in the world where nothing's heterogeneous, Jacob's exactly right. It all just gets bit out, so it doesn't matter. But if there is a lot of ex-ante heterogeneity, then, then you could potentially do better, and it's a question as to how much better you could do. Yeah? But still, I've been waiting for you to say something about quality. Oh, great. Thank you. Ah, excellent. Say something about quality. That's a very practical question. Uh, great. So, yeah. So, one thing I haven't shown you. In the paper, we, uh, we look for quality. Um, so, basically, you can see from the payment data in California uh, how often they get dinged for quality. So, they do these tests all the time, and if you're behind on quality, they then uh, they ding you. And you can ask in the A plus B contracts, are there any more, do they get charged more often for quality deviations than in the standard contracts? The answer is no. The interesting thing about the A plus B contracts is that they're very aware of the fact that because they've put in place higher incentives, people are going to want to cheapen quality. People are going to want to get more weather days. They're going to argue more about other days. And so they basically, as far as I can tell, they tell the project engineers to be stricter than usual. And so there's no evidence that there's any difference on any of these measures, which is a little bit surprising. I guess the thing that's strange about highway procurement is that it's a very well-designed product, and it's something that's been procured many times before. So we know how to write a contract that says, this is what we're going to check for, this is what you have to do. It's difficult in general. Somebody's going to repair your kitchen. And then, then you worry a lot about multitasking problems. And since I can't contract on quality effectively, then when I contract on time, you just mess up quality or vice versa. Yeah. One other question. I'm not sure how to ask it clearly, but does it matter that, um, or is it the case that there is so much nesting of subcontracting happening here? So 
there's not just one contractor, the contractor is subcontracting the subcontractors. And how does that affect this? Market? Yeah, that's right. So that's, uh, I mean, so it's, A, it's certainly empirically true. There's a ton of subcontracting going on. Um, I think the right, I mean, in principle, it doesn't make that much difference, right? So if you at least, if you assume that the, con the prime contractor can write sort of flexible contracts with the subcontractors in some way, either directly like this or relationally, then the subcontractors are just going to inherit the incentives of the contractor above them. And I think that's pretty much what happens in practice. So, what about the, the risks, though? I mean, that seems to be the place where a subcontractor can be absorbing the risk that the, that the contractor we're seeing on the surface in your data is not absorbing that risk. That's true. I mean, I guess, well, it depends. Yeah, it depends. So the payment risk is going to go through. So yeah, so it again depends on whether the prime contractor is going to be um, is going to be putting these time incentives in the subcontracts. I guess if that's right, then then if I'm only responsible for the first third of the project, then only the risk from the first third of the project is my problem. The next third is your problem. The next third, is, and then you're right. If we're splitting up it over enough people, maybe maybe we're closer to risk neutrality than risk aversion, and we don't care so much about these risks. Um, I think yeah, that's a fair point. Well, if it's 50k, then if the 50k entirely goes to one person. And it's more risky. Well, it just depends on how you're thinking about the, the shocks, right? So like fifty K over a third of a million dollars is more than Oh yeah, I get yeah, yeah that's right. So you you you're splitting up the you're you're both splitting up the uh, the standard deviations of payments, but you're splitting up the payment as well. Yeah. Then it, but I mean then I could start thinking about portfolios, so and now you've got three of these little subcontracts and I don't know. I mean you're right, but it's 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 harder once we start thinking through this problem camp. So the, the, these engineers, they work for the city, right? Or the, the, the uh, for state, the state, right? yeah. So do they ever use like independent third parties to like evaluate those things if a delay is justified or not? Not as far as I know. Um, I mean, there must be independent audits at times because this is, you know, the government. So I'd be amazed if there weren't, but I, I haven't come across that. Okay. Cool. Thank you.